Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to speak today. It's been a wonderful conference so far. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about a project we did on data-driven parcellation uh, and computational methods for generalizing uh, some lessons we learned from 3D Big Brain uh, to in vivo MRI. Uh, so first of all, we worked with the 2015 hippocampal block. Uh, so that's 40 micron isotropic. Um, but I should say there's a caveat that some of the work was done at 80 microns just for uh, computational reasons. Um, so here is the manual segmentation that we did. So here we have the hippocampus embedded in the temporal lobe. And here are just a few uh, slices that we often see the hippocampus. So at the top here, a sagittal slice. Um, the, a coronal slice in an area that we most often sample, so the hippocampal body, and it has this familiar inward curl. Um, and then I also want to highlight a few slices from the anterior hippocampal head uh, and the hippocampal tail at the back here. Uh, so one thing I want to point out here is between the different subfields, there is typically a, well, there is always a relationship between these subfields that's consistent. However, sometimes when we sample this coronally, uh, these, these subfields are very much out of plane. And so we end up getting these discontinuities in any given slice. Uh, so this can be quite challenging. Um, and um, since a lot of people are interested in this problem, it's sort of generated a bit of confusion, I think, in the literature on the hippocampal subfields. Um, so I just wanted to highlight those two points and, and point that this is ex especially problematic in the head and tail here. So one interesting approach to this problem was to uh, do this multi-planar sampling of the hippocampus computationally in MRI, I should say. Um, so we actually did something similar to, to this as well. So if you just look at this video at the bottom right are just uh, successive coronal slices of our segmentation of the hippocampus. And then at the top right here are these multi-planar slices and you can see um, where they're taken from with this orange um, uh, rectangle here. Uh, and what you see is that um, in this case, the, the relationship between the subfields, uh, it's, it's still a little bit complicated by these smaller scale folds or digitations, but it is, the relationship between them is actually consistent. Um, so uh, we do think that this, this improves our sort of uh, our fundamental understanding of the hippocampus. Um, and, and potentially this could be uh, like very much more helpful for doing this uh, in, in MRI protocols. Uh, this is the same data, I just, uh, for those of you who prefer a static image, uh, I just wanted to highlight a few of those points and, and show again that uh, consistency. Uh, so um, that was the first point I wanted to make, just that this folding inside the hippocampus is complex and often out of plane, um, and potentially resampling along um, different planes could help a lot with this type of problem. Uh, it's only allowed by really having very dense or 3D sampling, um, which is part of the reason that Big Brain has been so instrumental. Um, I want to tell you about a second approach here, uh, which is basically unfolding the hippocampus to uh, hopefully simplify this problem even further still. Uh, so uh, this is some some um, this is an approach that we previously developed uh, in MRI, but basically the way it works is we'll do sort of a tissue segmentation where we take all of hippocampal gray matter together, um, and then we apply these this coordinate framework to all of that gray matter. So that's what I'm showing in these these two uh, surfaces here. Uh, and you can see one is going from anterior to posterior, one is going uh, basically from the neocortex on the medial side there inward to the dentate gyrus that's on the very innermost edge. Um, and those two gradients together make up a coordinate framework that when we can then map the, the, the different subfields in a single plane of view uh, all together. So that's what we did for our manually defined subfields here. Um, and you can actually sort of dynamically go back and forth between these two spaces. So some advantages to doing that. Uh, you always see this conti continu continuity, I suppose, between the different subfields. Uh, you can apply things like 2D spatial regularization. So for example, if you had um, data here instead of subfield definitions, you could smooth them in 2D. Um, you can also compute a perpendicular direction in a fairly straightforward way, uh, which is really useful for doing things like thickness um, or calculating a gyrification index or other laminar measures. Um, I want to point out um, another thing here, which is, so here on the bottom right is just the, what we were just looking at, big brain reference. Um, and here are a bunch of other hippocampi um, from a UPenn ex vivo data set. And I just want to highlight that there's huge inter-individual variability um, in just the gross shape of the hippocampus. So here we have sort of a typical example. Here we have a hippocampus with a very straight hippocampal body, and here's one with a very curved hippocampal body, uh, small or very large tail at the posterior here. Uh, or a fairly smooth hippocampus for, versus very, fairly digitated or gyrified hippocampus. Um, so um, 
all of these hippocampus or hippocampi were actually um, defined with the same set of subfield boundaries. In this case, all of these hippocampi were just flat mapped. And then the, the boundaries from the, our big brain reference were um, applied to these samples and mapped back to native space. Um, so we think that uh, potentially that's a, a very useful way to account for some of these inter-individual variabilities seen in the gross morphological shape. Now, finally, I just want to point out that these subfield boundaries that I'm talking about so far are not actually ubiquitous. Uh, there is uh, quite an active uh, discussion about this, including this uh, ongoing harmonization effort some of you may have heard of, um, which um, it's, it's been going for a few years now, but it's had some major setbacks in the head and tail of the hippocampus. Um, and so I just wanted to give you a quick sense of what some of these protocols look like. Um, but um, you can see in the hippocampal head here, uh, most of the protocols simplify it quite a bit. Um, so we actually wanted to speak on this issue a little bit. And so we took a, a data-driven uh, approach to this. So here, I'm just gonna show you, uh, this is not from Big Brain, this is from, again, from MRI, but I wanted to show you examples of some features that we could map here. So here, uh, we have the different thicknesses and the black lines represent our um, manually segmented uh, subfield boundaries from Big Brain. Uh, here, uh, gyrification index, and here, T2 weight. Um, and we saw some, some differences between the different subfields. It's a little bit noisy still, and it's only from one subject in this case. Um, but we wanted to go into more detail. So we went into Big Brain, and uh, we basically extracted those same measures and uh, many more. So things like thickness, curvature, um, some texture um, uh, features, uh, gyrification index again. Uh, and once you map that in big brain, you see a lot more detail. You see um, a lot more sort of differentiation between the different subfields. Uh, in curvature, you can even see the different digitations as so they fold inwards and outwards. Um, and then um, further features we even extracted still were, um, as Conrad and uh, Casey both explained, these sort of um, profiles across the, uh, the, the depth of the hippocampus. Uh, and the hippocampus has a simpler structure than the neocortex, but uh, we, we still mapped it using the same methods. So sort of a classic Amunds and Zillies uh, approach to this problem. So once we did that for all of these, um, basically summary statistics about those pro um, profiles, uh, we can map them out in our unfolded space again. And again, we see some features were really clearly differentiated between the different subfields. So um, the data-driven approach that we took to these features um, basically the, looks something like this. So first we apply a multi-scale uh, Gaussian smoothing pyramid. Uh, then we performed uh, PCA. Um, this was especially helpful for removing some of the redundant features. So some of the, um, some of the laminar features um, more or less contain the same information. So uh, they would get grouped together into a single component. And then we took the top uh, set of components that explain the most variance and we just performed k-means clustering on them. Uh, and so the different colors here represent the different uh, k-means clusters, and then the white, white lines represent the different subfield boundaries. Um, so um, you don't actually see much uh, anterior-posterior division here. You actually see mostly uh, differentiation in the subfield direction, and most of these lines are quite close to our manually defined uh, subfield boundaries. So that gave us a lot of confidence that uh, we're on the right track um, in defining these subfields. Um, we've repeated this same analysis using only the subset of laminar features and saw something quite similar, which makes sense given that these subfields are typically defined in a laminar way. Um, and we also repeated it again for morphological features only, so things like thickness and gyrification. Um, and there again, we saw some of these boundaries, we, we found sort of, I suppose, boundaries in some of the same places. Um, so that actually was quite promising because morphological features are something that may be a little bit more accessible for an MRI. Um, so, um, yeah, that's basically a summary of our data-driven approach, um, which we were pleased to see high overlap with our manual segmentations. Uh, I just want to point to one direction that we're going with this. So I really think that this sort of surface-based approach um, can be a very helpful way of understanding the hippocampus. So here's an MRI image, and I want to make you see this image as I typically see it. So I'll just move to higher and higher resolution here. Um, and it's fairly clear now what's happening inside the hippocampus. We have this folding structure like this. Um, and hopefully now if I sort of return to lower resolution, and even if I remove that structure, you can sort of see a topological continuity in that image. It doesn't look like a, so much of a jumbled blur anymore. Um, so hopefully that demonstration worked for you. Um, and this is sort of the motive behind uh, some of the software that I'm developing now to try and 
uh, infer this folding structure using more standard resolutions of MRI, um, which can then be flat mapped and we can apply, for example, the same set of subfield boundaries that we did in Big Brain. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank especially my supervisors, Ellie Kahn and Stephen Cooler, um, and everybody else, and you guys for your attention. Thank you, Jordan, for the beautiful talk. Um, is there any question? Anybody like to pose a question? I do not see somebody raising hands. Uh, maybe a first question from my side. Um, it is very interesting that you see how the how the um, how the laminar features actually explain the uh, um, the subfield delineations. Uh, would you think there is a chance in the future to do automatic uh, uh, automatic parcellation based based on this? Yeah, uh, I definitely think so. Um, so, um, sort of the problem that I'm trying to tackle um, currently, I suppose, is just actually getting those sort of laminar uh, surfaces, or in other words, sort of understanding the folding in the hippocampus. But I think once that's done, that makes the problem of parcelating the subfields automatically much, much easier. Um, so if, for example, in this unfolded space, uh, you could even just use that same uh, big brain atlas, and I think that would be a very good estimate. Um, or you could use additional features like T2 weight, um, which I showed before, and that could inform perhaps a 2D uh, surface-based registration. To, uh, to get a sub subject-specific automated subfield parcellation. Yeah, that sounds promising. There's another question. Yeah. Yes, uh, Timo, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, uh, hi, Jordan. So hi, I'm hi. very curious about your results because uh, you demonstrated um, somewhat on not, not analogous findings with um, high resolution staining as well as uh, MRI results. So can you speak to uh, the resolutions that you looked at with regard to the MRI data and what type of contrast you use specifically? Yeah, so um, in this case, uh, that data that I showed was from uh, human connectome project data. So 0.7 millimeters isotropic, um, but we sampled it only along a mid surface of the hippocampus. So that was to avoid partial voluming with surrounding ventricles or surrounding uh, white matter structures. Um, and so the T2 weight, um, so uh, it's sort of roughly corresponds to intracortical myelin, um, which we think is actually inversely related to the density of uh, cells, at least inside the hippocampus. Um, so I think that's part of the reason that we saw. And I mean, that, that also needs further systematic investigation. Uh, and there's a, an emerging literature on that as well. Thanks. We have still a minute, and I saw Conrad asking in, in the session whether whether you see a chance to have the cortex uh, uh, the cortex segmentation really extend into the hippocampus. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I would love to uh, work on that sort of project and and uh, sort of um, stitch together the surfaces that you've beautifully developed in the neocortex with some of our uh, hippocampal surfaces as well. I I have a related question to that. So I can imagine that on the cortical side, it'll merge into to what Casey showed with the entorhinal cortex and then the isocortex. What happens on the, the medial wall side? Sorry, the me as in like at the dentate gyrus? So as you, as you go, as you continue away from the entorhinal cortex, what happens to the, the cortex of the hippocampus at that point? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. That's actually a true terminus of the uh, cortex. So um, the, the dentate, so you have the edge of the cortex and the dentate gyrus actually wraps that edge, making it a true terminus. Um, which is sort of a, has an interesting evolutionary background as well. So it's a, it's a full hard stop at that point. It's a hard stop, that's right. Lana has a question, I believe. Yes, I just saw it as well. So Lana, please, uh, I, um, can you talk? I think I enabled you. I think I can. <laughs> so okay. hi. Um, so the, I, I I just want to say that's a really beautiful work. Um, so my question is, you mentioned like striking inter-individual differences in shape. Um, yeah. And I wonder, based on your data, did you try to measure the volumes of the subfields and maybe try to, like, are any of the inter-individual differences driven by specific differences in um, subfields that you segmented? So I'm very interested in that question as well. Um, so, so far we haven't had very much 
um, like enough data or enough sort of information on the, the subjects who gave that data. Um, mm -hmm. But that is for something like a human connectome project where there's lots of data available. Um, yes, that is uh, a very natural question to ask, I think, and uh, we'd like to go there. So, Thank you. Yeah, thanks.